We're calling this series that we're starting today, uh, Break to Make, and uh, we're going to unfold some of the characters in the Bible whose life started out broken, or their day started out broken, I should say, but uh, at the end of it, God made something beautiful out of it. By the way, a couple things coming up I want to reiterate. First of all, guys, this coming Saturday... Uh, here at the church, a men's breakfast to launch our fall ministries for men. We hope all of you will come. There'll be bacon. Need I say more? Bring friends. Uh, that'll be at, I think, 9 o'clock. So uh, there's a table out on the plaza. Go uh, check in there and say you're coming so we, uh, we can plan a little bit better for that. And then another thing is, uh, this is really a, a big time for the Broken Bow Initiative because we're going to launch a church in about two months in Broken Bow on October 13th. That's the launch date. So uh, we're going to be training a lot of people, getting people prepared for that all-important launch day. So keep our Broken Bow Church in your prayers as we go forward. Psalm 118.24, this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. So is it? Even when it's raining in Grand Island again, is it? Is it? Is this the kind of day we're going to rejoice? Do you buy into the idea that God specially made this day, and so therefore we should find joy in this day? I mean, I mean, there's, there's the special days, you know. There's, there's those days that we'll never forget, the day that you experience something first, the first kiss, your first ride on a roller coaster, the first time you were moved to emotion by some great moment. Maybe it's the day that you or one of your children made a team, or it could be the day you graduated, or it could be the day that she said, I will, or it could be the day that you said, so will I. There's the day that your children are born. That's a great day. That's a day that we have no problem saying, Lord, you made this day. But then there's those other days. Not the make it days, but the broken days. The doubt days, the depressing, the death, the divorce days. Like, you know how uh, Pinterest is a wonderful thing. Sometimes we need pictures, it really is. So I found some pictures. You know what's a bad day when? Look at these. Ram tough, that's all I have to say about that. You know what's a bad day when? Oh, yeah. Those of us who live in Grand Island always have to drive a long way to get to a zoo. This is a bad day. Okay, you know it's a bad day when, yeah, ever, they say paint makes everything look new, not that. You know, you know it's a bad day when, I have no words for that. You know it's a bad day when, it's not that day, it's the day after that when you walk into the break room. That's when it's a really bad day. Okay, you know it's a bad day when... Now, you got to notice over, over Dale Ziegler's left shoulder is his older brother. You see it? Can you say the revenant? <laughs> this is the day that the Lord has made... I will rejoice. That's what we're going to talk about over the next several weeks. Uh, this is series is, is about bringing together all the days and seeing the redeeming power of God to, to take brokenness and make something out of it. And so let me begin at a pretty broken moment. It's the moment when Jesus found himself on a cross and there were others there with him. And I want to call today's message from shame to mercy. And let me read from Luke chapter 23, verse 32 and following. You'll be familiar with this. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The other people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. 
One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since we are under the same sentence. We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, truly I tell you, today, today you will be with me. You'll be with me in paradise. Do you remember the day when you realized, if you have had that day, that God's unmerited grace, that you can have it, that his mercy is for you? The moment when you realize that God loves you not because of you, but because of who God is. Do you remember that day? Have you had that day? Last Sunday, 17 people walked into this baptistry on a day that I hope you'll never forget. And I don't think even one of those folks came that day thinking this would be their day. But God spoke to their heart. God whispered to them, today, today's your day. I had a day like that. I can't remember the date, but I do remember the year and the month. It was July of 1979. And it was just like every other day in a string of bad days. It started out as a bad day for a bad, bad man. And I'm going to be honest with you because we're in church. And if you can't be honest with people in church, then quite frankly, what are we doing in church? So anyway, people get the, by the way, people get the wrong idea about preachers. So people, some people tend to assume that the guy on the stage kind of lives and talks and, and thinks like he does on stage, right? So uh, it's kind of this up there kind of view of the preacher. So I was in the store the other day, and I hadn't shaved for a day. It was my day off. I had a ball cap on. I had an old t-shirt and cargo shorts on and, and flip-flops. And I walked down this aisle, and I saw somebody from our church coming right at me, and, and she didn't recognize me, which I love. And I, I said, hey, how are you? And she looked at me, and she was startled, and she said, you're not up there. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'm not up there, and you need to know that right now. You look normal, she said. Well, preachers are normal, kind of normal. I don't know what you think about me. Frankly, I really don't care what you think about me. I care about what he thinks about me. But I can tell you that on July something or another, 1979, I was a bad man living out a string of bad days. Maybe about five years of bad days. And the Scott Jones that woke up early on July 1979 wasn't the same Scott Jones that woke up this morning to get here bright and early to preach at a church. I was waking up in the middle of the morning with a mouth that tasted like a combination of the Sahara Desert and a feedlot. I was waking up in the reality of what another day looked like for a bad man making bad decisions. And let me tell you what it delivers. You will not be surprised. It delivers shame. And honestly, I really had no hope whatsoever when I woke up that morning that that morning would be any different than any other. But the worst day of my life didn't begin on that morning. It began maybe five years earlier when I started making really bad decisions. But on that day, in a very deep, dark, desperate day, a day like this in weather, by the way. I woke up and there were thunderstorms. On that day, the worst day of my life didn't end that way. It became the best day of my life because there was mercy. What does a person having the worst day of their life see? Uh, We already read about three men having a really bad day. Jesus and the two thieves that died with him on the cross. Max Lucado, in a book called Grace Every Day, which, by the way, inspired this series, dramatically describes it this way. What the thief sees. Dirty walls and a dingy floor, rash and sunlight squeezing through the cracks. The prison is shadowed. 
his day more so. Rats scurry through the corner holes. He'd do the same if he could. What the thief hears, soldiers' feet shuffling, a prison door opening, a guard with compassion of a black widow spider. Get up. Your time has come. What a thief sees. Defining faces lining a cobblestone path, men spitting in disgust, women turning in derision. As a thief crests the top of the hill, a soldier yanks him down. Another presses his forearm against a beam and braces it with his knees, and he can see the other soldier reach for the mallet and a spike. What the thief feels, pain, breathtaking, pulse-stopping pain, every fiber of his body on fire. What the thief hears, groans, moans, death, his own. Soldiers grunt as they lift the cross. The base thuds as it falls into a hole. Pain, death, he sees them, he hears them. But then the thief hears something else. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. A bad man on a bad day hears Jesus pray on a Roman cross. Now, if you were him... How would you respond to that? Here's what most people do in their worst day, in the day of their darkness. Most people mock God. They really do. That's one of, one of the two men who were crucified with him did. It says in verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Now, remember, he was in the exact same place as Jesus. He had been shamed. He had been nailed to a cross. He looked over at Jesus, and just like everyone else there, he hurled slander. It says he railed abuse on Jesus. He yelled, I thought you were the one. Save yourself. Save me. He didn't believe that Jesus was God's Messiah. His tone was bitingly sarcastic demeaning save yourself save us see both of the thieves on the cross they they cried out for salvation this guy didn't mean it his heart wasn't there he didn't believe that jesus was god's messiah here's the problem when you turn your shame into disbelief and mocking god it just crushes you as a person Psalm 14, 1 says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. This was a fool on the cross. It says they are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. Shame will do that to you. Shame will make you bitter. It will make you unforgiving. You become always the victim of other people. It creates a life where you live it in regret. Here's a man who came down to the last miserable moment of his miserable life and he hurled mockery at the only one who could do anything about it. One look at the cross and we can see how serious God is about delivering us from our past. It says in the scripture he was led like a sheep to the slaughter because of our rebellion, because of our shame and guilt. How do you think God will respond? Listen to me. How do you think God will respond to people who mock that? What will the Holy One do to those who treat the gift of grace with contempt? So you can choose on your baddest day to mock God. There's another choice you can make. You can just shame yourself. You can just live in shame. You know, I... I, Appreciate the honesty of the second criminal. He said in verse 41, we deserve this. And who can argue with that? I mean, we do argue with that, don't we? I mean, you look all around and you hear the constant denial of people, one person after another, who just sing the victim song on life. Why me? Why me? You hear it in the supervisor's office. 
You hear it in the principal's office. You hear it in the counselor's office. You hear it in the banker's office. You hear it in the doctor's office. Why me? Why do I deserve this? But then, on the other hand, there are those who pile shame on themselves like it's their job. Looking back at an event or a choice or even an entire life, you just say, I just, I've just blown everything. And it's the worst to live in shame, especially when you know that you really could have done something about it. The great thing about the, the past, or the, I guess the worst thing about the past, is that you look back and it's truthful. There's a lot of truth in the past. And it's hard to deny it. And we live in regret. If only I had, and you can fill in the blank. If only I had, and then this sick feeling overcomes you again. And the worst thing about looking back is it's not hypothetical. It's true. And there are consequences. Maybe not a cruel crucifixion, at least yours. His for sure. It's hard to believe anyone deserved that kind of death. Even a thief. And I don't know what these guys stole. I don't know what they did to deserve this. They were criminals. But this one guy said, you know what? We do deserve this. He doesn't, but we do. Shame is a horrible cross to bear. And if there was ever a culmination of a broken life and a broken moment, it's this man's life. And you talk about a person who had every right to shame himself, it would have been him. And he could have mocked God. And he could have remained steeped in his shame. But on the baddest day of a bad man's life, he takes a different approach. He turned to God for mercy. And let me ask you a very simple question. Starting right now, how are you going to respond to God when it comes to shame? And look, the question is not, are you a thief or a criminal? Because I'm going to be honest with you because this is church. And if we can't be honest here, where are we going to be honest with each other? You're worse than that. You say, well, that's, a, that's insulting. You know what God says about us when we sin? He says it makes us enemies of him. That's the reality of my sin. The reality of my sin, if I stay up, detached from God, I remain his enemy. And, and I can mock him, and I can live in that, or I can do something else. The question is this, are you going to reject Jesus, or are you going to throw yourself on the mercy of his cross? Because that's what this second criminal did. He didn't mock God, and he had shame, yes, but he allowed that to be the catalyst to throw his life on the mercy of Jesus. He challenged that first one. He said, we are punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. This man has done nothing wrong. Don't you fear God, he said. That's what people who are being saved do. They ask those kinds of questions. They understand that I fall short of God's glory. I deserve what I'm getting. And so I confess it. No more self-pity. No more victim's mentality. Shame and regret can cripple you or it can cure you if Jesus is in the center of it. You don't have to wallow in self-pity. You don't have to call it quits. You don't have to live like there's no tomorrow. The scriptures are full not only of second chances like the thief on the cross, but also a warning that guides us how to evaluate our own failure. It's too many, too often now people are going to churches and they're hearing the preacher talk about anything but their sin, their failure, mine as well. Those churches need to go away if that's all they're going to do. We have to look at ourselves clearly and truthfully so that God can do something with the truth of our lives. This man, he confessed he was a sinner. He trusted in Jesus at that moment. People who are being saved know the only hope they have is found in the one who went to the cross for them. That's Jesus, of course. And he asked, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom? And he threw himself on the mercy of God. He admitted Jesus was the only hope he had. And he asked him, to bring him with him into his new kingdom. 
If you are ready to kick your shame and regret to the curb, then remember the criminal on the right. And if there is a breath in your lungs and any life left in your body, then cry out to Jesus and tell him that you're a sinner and that you deserve different, but you appeal to him. And I think you're going to hear him whisper something different to you than you've heard in the past. I think he'll say to you, today, today you'll be with me. You know, like everything in life, good or bad, God is able to use bad for good. Even shame. Even past regrets. Because he can show you a different future. For both of the men crucified with our Lord that day, it was a break or make moment. For one of them, a bad day for a very bad man was met with the mercy and grace of a forgiving God. What did he hear? Father, forgive them. What did he see? The unlimited love of a father who loves his children to die on a cross for them. What did he gain? He gained what a broken, beaten down 19-year-old loser gained in his apartment on 108th of Maple in Omaha in 1979. Today, today you will be with me. And so can you. He can take your shame and offer you something new. Mercy. Let's pray together. Lord, today, right now, immediately, no further disgrace, no more guilt, no more self-purging or shame-laden memories, no more of the accusations. You neglected me. You made the mistakes that deserve this. You made promises you didn't keep. Lord, today, let, let us hear something different. Let us hear you whisper over the screaming accusations. Today, you can be with me. Today, this day, through the pain, through the crucible, when others are nailing you to the post and when your shame accuses you, will you take your shame and let him have it? Lord, we want to hear you say, the cross makes it different. My cross, the one that I bore, Jesus, let us hear the message. I took upon myself what you deserved. You didn't deserve that, Lord. And when we come to this communion time, we are com commemorating that fact that even though you didn't deserve it, your love accepted it, our shame. We celebrate that moment. Even though it's not deserved, we are so grateful. In Christ's name we pray, amen.